going now. So, just want to welcome you guys to this paper zero lecture and just to introduce briefly Tai Hu, who's a PhD student or is just, and it is a PhD at least, in uh, history faculty. Basically, I think this lecture is really cool because uh, privatization is something that is spoken about loads, at least in development economics that I do, and it's linked quite intrinsically to the ideas that are put forward by a lot of neoclassical economists about that this is just. The way that they speak about it, at least from my perspective, is just quite flippantly, like it's just a thing that you can do. And I think that this is a really nice lecture, just a, sort of looking at the, the politics and the detail, details around it with this obvious case study that you see in front of you, and that's, I think, just very interesting and ties some great work in it. So, let's uh, round, give a round of applause for Taku. Uh, well, thank you very much. The last time I gave a lecture to uh, this amount of people, it was a uh, revision lecture for uh, one of the undergrad exams. I was very nervous, so I think I ended up talking about football, if I remember very correctly, by the end of the lecture. Um, hopefully that won't re reoccur this time. So as you can see, the title of uh, this talk is called The Politics of Competition, Thatcher and the Privatization of the Electricity Supply Industry in 1989. Um, so before I um, go into the details, first of all, I'd like to talk about what this talk is about, or rather what this talk is not about. I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm not very good with numbers, I'll have to admit it before I start. Um, and this presentation is not really about discussing the pros and cons of privatization per se. I mean. That's a debate that's taking place uh, between economists, political scientists, you name it. Um, the debate is still ongoing. But rather what I try to do is to sort of give you an idea of the decision-making process that underlies the process of privatization, especially how different stakeholders sort of interact and clash with each other during this process. So, and another thing that I wanted to stress is we tend to, I think it seems to be a bit of a fashion these days uh, when talking about privatization, you know, you talk about politics and economics. And we talk about these two, especially in relation to privatization, as if, you know, what actually took place was not based on economic ideology at all. It was all politics, or the counter-argument being, well, no, this had very firm economic grounding. So there is this kind of conceptual dichotomy between the political and the economic, or the technical. And what I try to do here is to show that, well, this process is actually much more complicated. It's, it's a mix between, um, well, let's see, political considerations, political interests, personal interests, uh, and also perceptions impressions, perceptions and impressions that different stakeholders have of each other. Also cultural prejudices as well, and how all these things sort of mesh into uh, the making of policy. And the takeaway from this lecture, well, I know I'm keenly aware that I'm giving a lecture, uh, that, uh, that I'm lecturing in a lecture series called Rethinking the Basis of Neoclassical Economics. But really, I think what I want to talk about is that this is not only about neoclassical economics as such, but about economics in general, especially the relation between economics and policy making. And I'd like to question, and I hope you also question by the end of this lecture, if I'm successful, that is, uh, but we can sort of wonder, question about the air of objectivity that surrounds the discipline of economics and sort of take a much more nuanced view in understanding how certain economic ideologies or economics are applied in policy. Um, just to give you a brief background uh, to this paper, this actually forms a very small part of, my, of, of the last chapter of my dissertation. Um, so just to give you a brief, let's say, political uh, context, Thatcher comes into power in 1979 with the promise of ushering a new period of prosperity, politics, economics in Britain. And in this case, it will be the promise of rolling back the state. Now, 
during the conservatives' years in opposition from 1974 to 1979, there were a lot of discussions uh, concerning the nationalized industries. So what do we do with them? There was a broad consensus that there has to be less state intervention in the running of nationalized industries or the economy in general. But during this time, let's say up until 1982, uh, during the first years of Thatcher's first administration, there wasn't much of a concrete, let's say, uh, there wasn't a concrete roadmap or program as to how privatizations of nationalized industries uh, should take shape. There was just a consensus that the state had to be rolled back, but how? It was still being discussed well until 1983. Now, in the first few years of Thatcher's first administration, privatization is not the number one priority. Thatcher has, and the Thatcher government has other priorities to tackle, notably the economic recession in the early 1980s, uh, the threat of a miners' strike in 1981. But the momentum, the political momentum for privatization starts growing after the, uh, after the Falklands War, and especially after the defeat of the, uh, the National Union of Mine Workers during the miners' strike of 1984 and 1985, which kind of gives a massive, let's say, confidence boost to Thatcher, as well as those who are arguing for a new type of industry or economic setup. Now, privatization assumes much more importance in the language or in the discourse employed by the Conservative Party after 1983, and it becomes one of the uh, objectives, let's say, in the 1983 Conservative Election Manifesto. Now, also bear in mind that there are also the, uh, the work of economists such as Stephen Littlechild, Mike Beasley, or Alex Henney. Now, these people, whom we will now consider to be firmly entrenched in mainstream economics as such, back in the days, in the 1970s, they were sort of considered to be fringe economists, if that makes sense. Uh, and their ideas were not really picked on, about, picked on by policymakers until, let's say, 1983. There were a lot of academic interest in this topic and this subject, but, not actual, but there was no concrete policy, let's say, proposal as such. Uh, that will be grounded on the work of these economists. Now, the objectives of privatization, there can be many objectives to privatizing anything, really. Uh, these are just a few bullet points uh, of the objectives that were uh, put forward. So number one, generating revenue for the treasury. Well, if you sell off state assets, let's say in uh, British telecoms or British petroleum, the Treasury naturally gets more revenue, so it's good for them. Um, weaken the hold of trade unions uh, sh and introducing shareholder democracy. Well, these two are much more, they're much more political in their objectives and has, to do, has more to do with the kind of political ideology of the, uh, the Thatcherites. And these two are actually quite important considerations. Now, in addition to that, there are all these, there's a host of economic objectives that people thought privatization would achieve, such as introduce efficiency, whatever efficiency actually means, lowering of, pr lowering of price, and also rendering benefit to the consumers. Now, efficiency, lower price, consumer benefits, these ideas are all out there, but they're never really kind of systematically analyzed or, let's say, distinguished in the, uh, in the analysis carried out by uh, the conservatives or within the treasury at this point. Now the initial wave of privatization, or shall I say denationalization, because that was the word that was used uh, during this period, started off by the selling off of government shares in British Petroleum. Uh, the government had 51% share in British Petroleum and one of the first things that Nigel Lawson, who, who at this time was the uh, Secretary of State for Energy, later to become Chancellor of Exchequer, These are the, this was one of his uh, first actions. Uh, the, n the second uh, notable privatization was basically denationalizing or basically uh, getting rid of British National Oil Corporation, the BNOC, in 1982, which was a uh, nationalized oil industry, uh, the brainchild of which goes back to uh, 
a lot of, let's say, left to the center labor politicians, and especially by Tony Benn in the mid 1970s. This was privatized and its assets sold off to the private in 1982. And more seriously, British Telecoms in 1984. British Telecoms was, let's say, one of the first state utilities to be privatized. Um, but the privatization of British, Telecom, of British Telecoms was not that politically controversial at this time. And it took place uh, relatively in a straightforward manner. Things become trickier when it comes to state-run energy industries. Now, the first state energy industry to be privatized was British Gas. Um, basically, as I mentioned before, Nigel Lawson was the most vocal proponent of privatization. Uh, he's a very remarkable man. You can still sort of, uh, he also, he's still very much in the media, gives very respectable opinions about climate change, and there's no such thing as climate change. Um, and uh, at this time, he had this belief that there was no such thing as an energy policy as such. All there was was supply and demand, and the government's role was just to oversee the supply and demand of basically uh, energy resources. So that's his stance, and he is the person who really kickstarts the uh, movement towards privatizing the um, state-run energy industries. <coughs> now, it should be said that when British Gas was privatized in 1986, it was privatized as a whole, basically meaning that it was privatized as a privatized monopoly. It wasn't actually broken down. Now, this went against the wishes of Nigel Lawson and also Margaret Thatcher, who basically wanted to break up British Gas into smaller companies in order to increase competition. This attempt was sternly resisted by the chairman of British Gas, uh, Dennis Rook, and also Lawson's successor to uh, the Department of Lawson's successor as the uh, successor, uh, Lawson's successor as the Secretary of State for Energy, Peter Walker. Now, why, why were Thatcher and Lawson unsuccessful in their attempt to break up British gas? Well, there are a number of reasons. First of all, there was the stern, there was opposition from the industry itself, unsurprisingly. But more importantly, was the role of Peter Walker. Now, Peter Walker is someone who can be considered as a wet, uh, despite the fact that he's in the cabinet. He is not really enthralled by the kind of privatizing, eth the privatization ethos of Thatcher or Nigel Lawson. And he's actually quite critical, vocally critical towards, um, critical against some of Margaret Thatcher's economic policy. So Peter Walker had a very intransigent line that British gas was unique, that although it's a state-run energy industry, it is not a utility in the truest sense of the word, unlike water or electricity, because gas in itself, as, a, as one of the fuel industries or one of the fuel energy resources in the country, had to compete with other fuel sources, such as coal, electricity, whatever. That was the argument that was employed by British Gas, as well as Peter Walker. Now, Nigel Lawson, in his memoir, records with a lot of disdain to uh, Peter Walker. Ultimately, however, Lawson had to yield to Walker's and Rook's demand for a number of reasons. Firstly, both Dennis Rook and Peter Walker was very were, they were very insistent that unless British gas was privatized as a whole, they would both resign, which at this time was not a very, was not very let's say, uh, propitious for uh, Margaret Thatcher because privatizing British gas was one of the election manifestos in 1983. Thatcher in her memoirs uh, recorded that there simply wasn't enough time for, uh, there, was simp there simply wasn't enough time to go over the details of breaking up British gas and therefore had to be privatized as a whole. But really from Thatcher's perspective, losing Peter Walker, despite the fact that she didn't appreciate him too much, was sort of seen as, let's say, um, it could lead to a situation where Walker could have been a political liability. I mean, Walker was quite a popular member within the Conservative Party. And if, had he resigned, he would have been a very vocal member at the backbenchers. There's also the theory that Thatcher potentially saw Walker as a, um, as a rival, as a competitor. So therefore, kicking out Peter Walker from the cabinet, she thought that it would be better to have him by her side and just neutralize him and just go along with what he's demanding, because that would be much more politically uh, expedient for her. 
Nevertheless, the failure to introduce competition to break up British gas was a political sour point for Thatcher, and it was seen as, let's say, an embarrassment to both Lawson and Thatcher. And this was to have quite a significant, let's say, impact on how the electric electricity supply industry was to be privatized. Now, the Central Electricity Generating Board, or the CGB in short, and this was one of the, uh, one of the three bodies constitute, con constitute, cons consisting or comprising the nationalized electric electricity supply industry in Britain. So uh, the elect electricity industry uh, as of 1989 consisted of these, those three bodies, as you can see there. You had the CEGB, which was in charge of generating electricity and transmitting them to, in bulk. The CGB would transmit the uh, this bulk electricity to the 12 area boards. Basically, these area boards were, uh, let's say, regionally based energy companies that would be in charge of distributing this bulk electricity to the consumers. And it was also they were, they were also in charge of all the commercial activities on the local level. You have the Electricity Council, which is sort of seen as a federative or cons consultative body. Uh, the Electricity Council was in charge of, let's say, the overall commercial policy of the electricity industry, as well as being responsible for giving out official projections. But really throughout its history, it is rather a toothless organization. Now, the CGB is by far the most powerful uh, and the largest organization amongst these three. In fact, the CGB, can be, the CGB was probably the single most capital intensive body and in all of the public corporations from this throughout the from the 40s until the until the breakup of the CGB as you can see um, the current cost asset of the CGB was around 32 billion pounds as of 1989 British gas was just 8 billion pounds so you can really see how you can really see it kind of gives you an idea of the sheer size of the CGB um, and this organization was the butt of criticism for many of the, uh, let's say, for many conservatives, for many conservative policymakers who were much more uh, favorable to competition. It was seen as being inefficient, impervious to fiscal discipline, completely unanswerable to consumers, unable to expedite construction work, and also let's say, opaque and not very transparent. Now, the CGB at this time was headed by a chap called Sir Walter Marshall, who was, unlike other CGB members, was a mathematician a nuclear and a nuclear scientist. Now, Walter Marshall is quite unique in the sense that he enjoyed very close relations to, very close relations with Margaret Thatcher in a way, it was because of Margaret Thatcher's own interest in nuclear energy and her own interest in the works of Walter Marshall. But it was more to do with the fact that Marshall was sort of seen as the one who kept the lights going during the miners' strike. Uh, he actually became Lord Walter Marshall after 1984. So he was a figure who most policymakers could not simply ignore. <coughs> He's also a very eccentric character who used to boast about how large his belly was and how big his appetite was. And he used to make a lot of origami figures during board meetings and just throw them to its board members. He's a very interesting character. Now privatizing the CGB. So as I said before, the government, because of the embarrassment of failing to break up British gas, was intent of avoiding the mistake with British gas and it wanted to break up the CGB. Privatizing the electricity industry was one of the key conservative election manifestos in 1987. Now Peter Walker is replaced by Cecil Parkinson who's also a firm believer who can be considered a dry, the driest of the dry, a firm believer in competition, very loyal to Margaret Thatcher and he was one of the he was one of the first led to cabinet ministers and policymakers to really use the term and propagate the term 
consumer benefits, consumers, and supporting uh, the privatizations of the government. And he had even more reason to be loyal to her. I mean, Cecil Parkinson was at one point considered to be a potential, um, a potential, let's say, a potential chancellor of exchequer material back in 1983. But there was a little scandal where he basically had an affair with his private secretary and it got leaked to the press and he was basically forced back to back benches. In 1987, he was literally brought back from the cold, largely because of Margaret Thatcher who had, who liked him. And apparently, according to Nigel Lawson, she had a uh, weakness for tall, blonde, good-looking men. Cecil Parkinson was a good-looking man as well. This is Nigel Lawson speaking. There's every reason for Cecil Parkinson to be absolutely loyal to Thatcher and to be absolutely committed to the privatization of the CGB. Not surprisingly, the CGB was absolutely opposed to the breakup. Um, now, the key point of contention was whether the transmission could be split from the generation. So just to give you an idea, I, do any of you guys know how electricity is basically supplied? I mean, just to give you a 20 second crash course, you generate electricity from the power stations, you transmit them through transmission lines through different regions, and then once the electricity is transmitted regionally, the area boards, which I mentioned, who I mentioned before, would distribute them to the uh, end consumers, the final users. Now, both Parkinson and Thatcher wanted to actually split the transmission, the grid from the generation, because they believed that this would increase competition. Walter Marshall was completely against this, and he gave all sorts of technical economic reasons as to why this was not feasible. What he wanted was a privatization that was similar to British gas, basically, privatized the CEGB as a privatized monopoly. Who would be the chairman of this new monopolized CEGB? Walter Marshall, of course. So he had his own personal interest in this. But deep down, he had another concern with privatization, namely, what's going to happen to the nuclear power stations? As you know, there's a lot of debate going on with Hinkley Point C, with the, uh, the strike price of Hinkley Point C, whether it's economically viable, feasible, what not. The thing about nuclear power stations and nuclear energy in general is that it's very difficult to privatize them. If they were in the public sector for, if they, if they had been in the public sector for around five decades or four decades, and you want to privatize them, you have to calculate the liabilities, the decommissioning costs. You have to basically translate costs to consumer price, which is a very difficult thing to do. And Marshall feared that if this happened, there won't be any more nuclear energy program in the United Kingdom because no private investor will want to carry that burden in the private sector. So this was his key concern. Interestingly enough, this was not the view of Margaret Thatcher. I mean, Margaret Thatcher was probably the most arduous believer in nuclear energy. She was, one of the, she was probably the only prime minister, as far as I can tell, or the first prime minister, who, uh, supported, who supported the expansion of the nuclear power program along uh, environmental grounds. And she did not think that privatizing the power stations would be impossible. Of course, she was completely oblivious, like many other politicians, to the dodgy economics that characterized the British nuclear power program. Um, more, of more which I'll talk about later, because that's very complicated as well. On top of that, you have a tension between Parkinson and Marshall, i.e. it's sort of like a competition between two of Thatcher's favorites. Now, Parkinson, in his memoirs, remembers Mar Walter Marshall as being, a very, as being a very noteworthy character, a very competent man, uh, came straight to the point. And he records that he actually liked Walter Marshall despite the fact that he was on the opposite side of this debate. And that he also felt sorry for Marshall uh, when, his, when Marshall could not get his way. But according to Sir John Guinness, whom I interviewed for my PhD dissertation, 
and who was a deputy secretary of state for energy at this time, Parkinson used to come and confide in him and tell him that he could not sleep because he thought that Marsh, he could, he could not sleep because he was worried that Thatcher would actually side with Marshall, not with him. So there was that kind of, let's say, personal rivalry going on between the two. Now, as I said before, I, I um, interviewed this uh, distinguished gentleman, Sir John Guinness, who was Deputy, Deputy Secretary. Um, I also interviewed a man called Willie Rickett, who was the main civil servant uh, in charge of the privatization team. So these two men were closely involved. They were basically the ones who designed the, uh, the privatized electricity industry. There's a nuanced difference between them uh, when they remembered uh, this period of their lives. Sir John Guinness was very insistent that this was something that was demanded by the politicians. The politicians wanted competition, no matter what the cost. He really stressed the kind of polit political or ideological aspect um, behind this policy. And he rather had a very, very stoic kind of, let's say, attitude towards privatization. When I asked him, did you think back, in the, back when you were doing this that privatizing the CGB was necessary? He simply replied, not really. The CGB did keep its lights on. Politicians wanted it. Doesn't mean that he was opposed to it, but he had a kind of very um, nonchalant stance towards this whole question. Willie Rickett, on the other hand, who used to work as Margaret Thatcher's private secretary and uh, who was a lot younger than Sir John Guinness at this time, he was much more au fait with the, uh, the works of Stephen Littlechild and Mike Beasley, much more au fait with the ideas of neoclassical, with the ideas uh, advanced by neoclassical economist. He told me that he did believe that breaking up the industry would actually be beneficial for the overall economic and technological performance of the electricity industry. But another very interesting thing that he said was that when he was actually working on this, although he consulted economists, he stressed the point that economic ideas did not, were not that central to what they were doing. I mean, they consulted them. The privatization team consulted the economists. But they were not as if taking the advice of Stephen Littlechild and giving much weight to it. No, this was really a kind of work that was done between civil servants, uh, civil servants who were au fait uh, with economics, but civil servants who nevertheless had to both uh, balance the demand made by politicians, the tight time schedule, and also uh, the overall economics. So this was something that Willie Rick, this is something that Mr. Rickett stressed many times when I was interviewing, which kind of, kind of gives us a very, uh, let's say, interesting perspective on how economists can actually influence um, these policies, uh, policies such as privatization. Another thing that both Rickett and Guinness stressed was that the CGB was being completely intransigent and uncooperative. They were, simply were not providing enough information. They refused to even entertain the idea of the CGB being broken up, despite the fact that this was the will of Margaret Thatcher. And Willie Rickett remembers how obsessed the CGB was with building nuclear power plants. Rickett was keenly aware that the economics of nuclear energy did not really hold up, especially if you're going to privatize the electricity industry. And at this time, the oil price and gas prices were tumbling. So instead of building nuclear power plants, Rickett believed that it would have been a lot more beneficial if you built combined cycle gas turbines. Basically, uh, these are, let's say, power stations that burn natural gas to, pr to produce electricity. Because the consensus was that burning natural gas at this stage would have been much more economic, much more economical and technically feasible. And during discussion with the CGB, when Willie Rickett actually brought this issue up, brought the possibility of the CGB considering, considering combined cycle gas turbines, the reply he got from the CGB was simply that the CGB did not consider 
natural gas a viable form of electricity generation. There was no additional information provided by the CGB. So this really colored Ricketts' view of this organization of the CGB as an organization that was intense, that was impervious to, let's say, economic logic, and that would really wanted to just maintain the status quo just for its own sake. Now, at one point, Marshall threatened to resign with his entire staff uh, if the breakup of the CGB was pushed through. And he actually notified Parkinson that he was serious about doing this. Now, for a chairman of a nationalized industry, going to your boss, the Secretary of State of Energy, and then telling him that if you, do, if you actually push forward with a policy approved by the prime minister, we will resign, doesn't really give you a good impression of the industry. In a way, I think Parkinson was, he felt threatened to the extent that he actually took the entire privatization team outside of the, Secret outside of the Department of Energy and they're discussing these privatization options at a different place somewhere near Oxford, which I can't really recall right now. And keeping all the information, trying to keep all the information secret without passing on that information to the CGB. Adding to this was the, uh, the kind of creative tension, as I like to call it, between the CGB, the Electricity Council, and the 12 area boards. Now, from the perspective of the 12 area boards and some key personnel within the Electricity Council, if the CGB was broken up into different companies, these organizations, the Electricity Council and the area boards who before had almost no say in the running of the electricity industry, would not only be much more influential, but it would also bring about personal interest to them as well. There's also a clash of personalities between the, uh, the chairman of, of the Electricity Council and the different chairman of the area boards with the chairman of the CGB, Walter Marshall. I mean, Walter Marshall was absolutely detested by both the Electricity Council and a huge number of area board chairmen. Uh, now I'm actually skipping a lot of steps here just to sort of give you guys a much more, let's say, uh, give you guys a much simpler narrative. What happens in the end, Thatcher supports Parkinson. Despite her respect for Walter Marshall, competition is still her priority. The 1989 white paper stipulates the, uh, the breakup of the industry into two generating companies, PowerGen, or National Power, 12 regional energy companies based on the pre-existing 12 area boards, and an independent transmission company, the National Grid, as you know it now. The National Grid was to be a joint holding company with stocks, um, which would be jointly shared by the 12 regional electricity companies. So in the power balance between the regional, the power in, in terms of the power balance between the CGB on one side and the Electricity Council and the area boards on the other side, Thatcher basically sided with the, uh, the area boards and the Electricity Council. Much to the disappointment of Margaret Thatcher, however, the nuclear power plants themselves were not privatized. This is because the, the liabilities and the back-end costs turned out to be so much, higher than, so much higher than expected that it turned out to be absolutely unfeasible and impossible to, privatize, to, to, to have them privatized. Now, both Rickett and Guinness have, uh, were really angry with this part of the uh, privatization story. Because one of the reasons why they broke, they, the, one of the reasons why they broke up the CGB into only two generating companies instead of more was because the CGB insisted that the nuclear power, the CGB insisted that they had to have a big enough company that would be able to absorb all the liabilities of the nuclear power stations. Later on, when these two men received the price of nuclear power and the privatized environment, they were aghast by the fact that having already made a concession to the CGB, now it was the government who had to bear the cost of nuclear power because these two privatized companies could not bear the cost of them. This, is, this, this still remains a source of acrimony for these two, uh, for these two people. 
And later on, another company is created, Nuclear Electric, which remained practically under government control uh, until the mid-1990s. So concluding thoughts. Uh, whew, this is a very badly written slide. So what I wanted to say is, yes, the changes in economic ideas are absolutely fun. Uh, they're absolutely cru cru it's absolutely crucial in order to understand privatization. So is the political will. But what's also, more, what's also, in my point of view, as a historian, more important are the twists and turns of the process of how this polity is implemented. The impressions, the perceptions, the thoughts that people have, that the different stakeholders have of each other, and how this actually shapes and influences the final outcome. Um, and if you actually push this last, if you actually push this message further, we can also question ourselves to what extent this knowledge of the decision-making process, to what extent this complexity of the decision-making process colors our current view of the ideas of economists that support privatization. Hence the essay question, which I was meant to provide to you guys. Whether you want to write an essay on this or not, it's up to you. And a short reading list. There's, if anyone's interested in reading more about this or wants to know more about the literature behind this, do contact me. I've a whole corpus of this. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
if I remember correctly, quite adequately or quite substantially explained. Um, my impression, talking to both Guinness and Rickett, was that yes, the interest of the, the interest of private capital was definitely there, and yes, they had to sort of take them and take that into consideration, especially when it came to privatizing the nuclear power plants. But in the overall kind of model that they chose, it doesn't seem to have been, they did not seem to have been, let's say, the overriding stakeholder, put it that way. But then again, that's their opinion. And you actually never know whether that's true or not. It's very difficult to actually gauge whose influence is larger or not. I mean, th this is the beauty of policymaking, I, I guess. But I mean, if you're interested in more in like uh, looking uh, in other literature that deals with the role of um, private capital in this process, uh, I'll go back to my dissertation where I have my bibliography and all that, and I'll email it to you if, if that helps. Any more questions? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you very much.